OK, so um, primarily when we talk about extraction, that's going to be done late in the summer, sometime in July or August. You don't want to do it when it's cold outside, which um, it's not like it gets super frigid here in East Texas, where it might uh, be super cold in the Northeast. But we want to make sure that we do it during warm weather because it just truly makes the honey easier to extract. So does anybody have any questions about this? OK, I'll go ahead and move on. I say I'll move on. I have to figure. OK, there it goes. All right, so once you have your honey super box on top, um, how will you know when it's actually time to harvest honey? And so the bees are going to be filling the honeycomb with honey. But just because there's honey in the honeycomb does not mean it's ready. So I don't have a picture of it, but you'll actually be able to see bees removing the moisture from those cells. And whenever they have finished removing all of the moisture, they will seal it with beeswax. So when 75 to 80 percent of those cells have been capped, that's when you can harvest that frame. If you don't wait for all of those to be capped, there will be a lot of extra moisture and your honey will not have the shelf life um, that it needs to be stable. Now, people do take that and ferment it and make things like mead out of it. But for your typical honey sales, that is not desirable. So you really want to pay special attention to the percentage of sale of cells that have been sealed. So when it comes time to harvest the honey, um, just like with any kind of food process, you want to make sure that you are clean. You should, um, to the best of your ability, have clean hands, clean tools, a clean environment. You shouldn't be harvesting honey outside. Um, so we got to kind of use common sense on that deal. We definitely don't want to get anyone sick because we were not being um, really careful about our sanitation. Of course, you're going to want to put on your PPE, whatever that is to you. Some people want to go head to tail in a um, bee suit, or as our friend John showed us in the first session, you might wear a laundry hamper. I don't know. Um, but whatever is comfortable for you and whatever fits your hive. So you also want to make sure you have your hive tool because as you know, your lid stays on your bee box, when you go to pop those off, they'll be sticky with beeswax. You want to have your smoker, which you may not need one. Your bees may be really, really docile, but if you have a really agitatable, uh, reactive hive of bees, you're going to want to make sure that you can use your smoker and then a brush. Because as you pull these, the frames out of the honey super, there are going to be bees attached to them, and you need to be able to brush those off back into the box. Um, you're also going to want a container to seal the full frames away. So some people will just cover them with a towel or something. But to me, if you're taking this and you're planning on packaging it for sale for someone to consume in their home, I would want to do it in the cleanest way possible. So perhaps a container that you've dedicated specifically for transporting those full frames of honey to your processing station would be preferable. And you want to make sure you can close it because those bees are going to smell that honey and they're going to want to go to it. And you don't want to carry a whole bunch of your bees into your processing station. Uh, as you start to actually process through the, the frame, you will need some type of hot knife. Uh, they have electric ones or you can heat them, you know, however you see fit, or a comb. So does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, so once again, we want to make sure that all of our supplies are clean, food grade. Um, we want to make sure that any buckets that we're using, like um, my husband and I raise horses and we have lots of empty five gallon buckets from minerals. That would not be what I would want to process my honey in. I want to make sure it's a clean food grade dedicated to this um, container. OK, um, you can extract your honey by hand or you can use a honey extractor. So they have a manual version where you actually spin the extractor or they have, of course, an electric version, which is probably uh, a lot easier, but also more spendy. You want to also have a filter because whether you hand extract or you use the honey extractor, you're still going to have particles of beeswax. So you want to make sure you use a filter that is going to allow the honey to go through, but the beeswax 
knot. Um, you don't want to use one that is too tightly woven because sometimes it can also prevent pollen and things like that from making its way into the honey. So if you're trying to market your honey as local with um, allergen reducing properties, we want to make sure that the pollen's included. I would also recommend um, whether you buy buckets with valves already on them or you install them yourself, the buckets that your honey drains into, if you can put a stop valve on the bottom where you can open it to put the honey in your storage jars and close it, um, that's just so much less messy than trying to pour honey from the top of the bucket. And this is already not uh, the easiest process to stay clean anyways. And of course, you're going to want whatever it is that you're going to market your honey in, whether you choose a mason jar or one of the cute little bears, um, whatever it is that fits your personality and your marketing ideas. So, um, of course, as you go to do this, you're going to make sure you have your PBE, you're going to smoke your bees, you're going to check your frames in the honey super, and the frames that have hit that 75 to 80 percent capped stage can be safely harvested. So you're going to want to pull it out, brush the bees off, put it in your container, and then transport all of those to your clean processing location. Um, so if you decide to use you're going to do it by hand. You don't have a honey extractor. Essentially, you are going to get some type of spoon and you are just going to scrape everything out from the inside of that frame onto a filter or a sieve or a colander of some kind and allow that honey to drain into the container below. That process could take two to three days, depending on how warm it is outside. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, especially if you only have a few hives and you're not going to have just a whole bunch to do. That might not be a bad deal, but each standard size frame can hold between five and six pounds of honey. So you may end up with a lot more honey than you think you will. So when we talk about using an extractor, um, basically it uses centrifugal force to force the honey off of the frames. So these things spin really rapidly. And before placing your frames in the extractor, you need to use a hot knife to remove all of the uh, honeycomb, not honeycomb, excuse me, beeswax that's plugging those cells full of honey. So you're going to run your hot knife along the front side of your frame, removing all of that beeswax. You do want to go ahead and put that beeswax um, on your filter because there will be honey attached to it and that'll give you a chance for that um, honey to remove itself from the beeswax and still go into your final product. They do make a special type of comb to remove the seals from the back of those capsules. The hot knife usually won't work because the um, it doesn't stick out as far on the back side of the frame, if that makes sense. So when you're doing this, you do want to be sure that you're damaging the honeycomb as little as possible because you can reuse it and give your bees a head start. When you're just using a spoon and you're operating without an extractor, that is a lot harder to do. Um, so then you're going to go ahead and put your frames in your extractor and you're going to spin it and that will allow it to be expelled into the bottom of your extractor. Uh, you can then open the valve at the bottom of your extractor to drain it into a bucket. When it's all in your bucket um, and in between the bottom of the extractor and your bucket, I would place a filter so you don't have to go through this filtering process again, um, but you need something small enough that's going to remove the beeswax. And once you've removed that beeswax, of course, that is a byproduct that can be used on its own. So, um, as I already touched on, you want a bucket with a valve at the bottom. This process is already extremely messy. And when we're talking about food safety, we want to try to be as neat and sanitary as possible. Um, of course, the hot knife, if it's warm, it's going to cut through that beeswax so much, you know, so much easier. The filter we discussed a little bit, um, but something I haven't mentioned is that when you're through, you can take your beeswax, your empty frames, all of your tools, and you can actually put that outside near your hives and the bees will come up and they will essentially show robber behavior and they will clean all of your tools for you and recycle that uh, honey that would otherwise be wasted and take it back to their hive to be used. So um, that is the nitty gritty um, short and sweet version of how we can process honey. Does anybody have any questions or maybe someone might have some comments on how they do something differently? Uh, 
I've got a uh, video that I found on YouTube as I was trying to research and make, make slow investment purchasing equipment, and they used an electric fillet knife. And the gentleman shows how easy it is. If would you care for me to post that link so somebody could compare it? Looking at the cost of the fillet knife and the adapter to speed control it, it's cheaper than a lot of the hot knives that I've come across and more efficient. That's pretty neat. So of course, um, just like with everything, there's a thousand ways to skin a cat. So sure, you can post that video link in the uh, meeting chat if you'd like. Um, and I'm sure that there's probably lots of other ways that are equally, if not more effective. So, um, but yeah, those are great ideas. Anybody else? All right, well, I am going to go ahead and uh, stop sharing and turn it over to Miss Rebecca. It's all yours now. Okay, let me see if I can figure this out again. Can y'all see that on your side? Not yet. Hmm. It never fails to work before the meeting and then during it doesn't. Like every time it does this thing, so. You're still not seeing it? Not yet. Because it didn't give me the option like it did earlier to. Uh, to share screen. Huh. OK, hold on. There we go. Did you get anything from me on sharing? I have not. There it goes. Okay. All right, I'm gonna mute myself. Okay, so everyone can see the selling honey in Texas slide? Yes. Correct. Okay, okay. thank you all. Forgive my ignorance on that. Thank you, Jessica, for asking me to come on um, today and talk with you a little bit about uh, selling honey in Texas. I'll be the first to admit I do not have a clue um, what it takes to handle bees, have a beehive. Um, so I, I'm going to take absolutely no no knowledge in that. Um, but I do have some some uh, background in, in the, the food aspect of it, which is why she asked me to come on and, and talk with y'all a little bit tonight. So um, just kind of wanted to give that disclaimer before we got started um, on what we've got. But today I'd like to talk with you a little bit about, and this, some of this may be um, review, but um, when it comes to law and permits and things of that nature, licenses and whatnot, I felt uh, we needed to define what a beekeeper actually was in terms of the uh, Texas Agriculture Code. Um, also, I want to talk with you a little bit about the Senate Bill 1766. It's known as the Small Honey Production Operation, which, I, which I'm thinking um, based on what Jessica and I've talked about, I think many of y'all will probably fall under that, at least for now, until your operation grows. Um, so I want to talk with you about a little bit about that and the exemptions that it allows you as a small um, honey production operation. And then we'll just uh, we'll talk a little bit more about different ways to sell honey and, and honey products within the state of Texas. Uh, as I mentioned, I wanted to, to define beekeeper, um, and I say that just because it comes back into um, the Senate bill, it comes back into food manufacturing, uh, retail foods division, food um, FDA, things of that nature. So a beekeeper by definition, according to the Texas uh, Agriculture Code, is a person who owns, leases, or manages one or more colonies of bees for pollination or the production of honey, 
beeswax or other byproducts um, for either personal or commercial use. Um, so I just wanted to, to set that clear because the the TAC references a beekeeper and uh, kind of goes back to, to playing into that. And I think the biggest part with the beekeeper is it, it has to be yours, um, is, is where we're going to start seeing some of that in the lingo of the, of the law, making sure that it's actually your, um, something you're taking care of and you're managing. So I think Jessica started talking about this, this whole marketing thing, and I, I kind of got thinking on how I wanted to, to frame this talk tonight. Um, and really kind of got to thinking if, if I were going to, to start a, a bee production operation, what is what is my end goal? You know, am I doing it as a hobby? Am I doing it for agriculture exemption status? Am I doing it to to sell um, the products of the bees? Um, so I think that that really is important, um, which probably already y'all have already asked yourself, why am I doing this and what is my end goal? Um, so if you haven't, I want you to be thinking about that. You know, what are we going to do with this product when we get it? Um, so what do you what are you wanting to sell? You know, whether it be the honey, the honeycomb, Ooh. are you planning on making byproducts from that? Um, you know, cosmetic type things, lip balms, beeswax, lotions. Um, are you going from the consumption side of it and, and trying to produce a food product? So just some things to think about when it comes to that. And then once you've kind of thought, well, I've got something in mind or a product in mind, the next question you need to be thinking about is, where do I want to sell that? Um, because like many other things, when it comes to a, especially a food, um, there's different agencies that govern different things. There's different permits or licenses. Um, that you may need to get depending on one, the product you sell and two, where do you want to distribute that product at or, or where do you want to sell that product at? Um, so, you know, do you want to sell it directly to the consumer? Do you want to go through Internet sales, retail sales, use that product as wholesale? Uh, some examples from directly to consumers, um, which is talks about in the small production um, bee production operation bill um, would be some examples, you know, directly to the customer at your house. You, you meet at the house, you do an exchange there. Possibly a farmer's market, a farm stand, or what we see a lot of is municipal county or nonprofit fair or festival. Okay, so you're set up as a vendor there selling your product. Directly to the consumer is the key in that. Um, want you to be thinking about that. Is, is that. is that the avenue you're wanting to go down? Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, if that's the avenue you think you want to go down, I really encourage you to get online and print off Texas Senate Bill 1766. Went into effect in September of 2015. And really what the, the point of that was, was to give some small production operations some exemptions to where you didn't have to do everything that a large commercial production operation might have to do in order to to sell your your product. And I'm just going to kind of summarize that bill. But like I said, if, if this fits into your goals, you definitely need to be uh, abreast on that and um, knowledgeable on that on that Senate bill. So the key there is less than you're producing less than 2,500 pounds of honey per year. Um, you sell honey or a honeycomb that the bee beekeeper has produced themselves um, or with the help of, of an immediate family member. And it's very um, specific in the bill as to, as I mentioned, it references a beekeeper, which they toggle that back to the Texas Agriculture Code, which is why I wanted to make sure and give you that definition. Um, and then it is very specific that it, you did it. You produced that yourself and or with the help of your immediate family. Um, that's very important um, in the business side of it um, that I wanted to make sure that you were familiar with that, that verbiage. Another key thing in the Senate bill is that the honey or the honeycomb must be in Texas and managed solely by the beekeeper. Um, 
Some other key points within that um, Senate bill is, and I, I feel this is a very important one, is that you're only allowed to sell honey that is pure in nature, raw, and not blended. Okay, not blended, so it can't be infused. It can't be combined with other products um, or otherwise adulterated. So keeping in mind, if you're wanting to go this route um, and not have to get permits or licensing, the end product can only be the pure product. Okay, and there's a lot of people out there that are wanting to, to make other products. And I'm not saying that's not another avenue, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but if you are wanting to go this route under the Senate bill, you're getting some exemptions, not having to get permits, things of that nature. You're very limited on what you can sell. OK, um, you are going to have to properly handle that product, as Jessica mentioned, with the uh, the harvesting um, sanitation aspects, the bottling aspect of that. Um, and you're going to have to properly label that product. Um, and that kind of resorts back to the um, Texas Agriculture Code as well. And I've got some links to that in here, but you're, you can definitely just do a Google search on that and it will pop up. Um, but to summarize the labeling requirements, it's going to have to have the, the name of the product, the product weight, the beekeeper's name and address. And then the big thing is you're going to have to have that disclaimer statement that says bottled or packaged in a facility that is not inspected by the Department of State and Health Services. OK, so that is letting that customer know or that consumer know. That this was processed, you know, in, in somewhere that wasn't an inspected facility and there's people that um, are leery on that. There's people that, that don't mind that. Um, but as a rule, if this is the direction you're going to go, that label must contain that information. The other avenue is um, producing this product and I'm wanting to go maybe the retail. I'm wanting to sell this to retail grocery stores, retail restaurants, um, whether it be for resale at that point or use in their facility. Um, at that point, you're taking a different avenue. OK, you're going to have to abide by different rules um, and different guidelines. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that. As I mentioned, it's not only important to have an idea of what product you want to sell, but where do you want to sell that? What, what is your end goal when it comes to that? Um, and that doesn't mean you can't change during that course course of production, right? I mean, maybe start out small and and sell local and, and sell at farm stands and farmers markets and things like that. And, and if you find yourself at a position that you want to expand that, that doesn't mean at that point you can't go that direction. Um, so I just wanted to make sure, you know, don't ever give up on, on dreams when it comes to that because there are avenues for that. Um, something I, I do want to highlight is the internet sales. So as a small production operation, you can advertise via the internet, but you cannot do sales over the internet. If you are gonna, going to want to do that avenue, you're going to have to take a different path. Um, what you're going to have to do with that, um, and once again, this is kind of summarizing. Um, we could probably talk for several hours on some of this if we really wanted to, but I wanted just to give you some direction and some key departments to keep in mind and, and kind of get your brain thinking on, on what, your, what your goals are. So if you're wanting to go the retail, the wholesale internet type pathway, um, at that point, you're going to have to go through manufactured foods, OK, through Texas Department of State and Health Services. Um, Google that Texas Department of State and Health Service Manufacturing Foods Group. It should be your first link that pops up. And um, you're going to have to, you know, do an application fee for or fill out an application, apply for their permit. And, you know, it's a little bit, you know, there's some some things involved with that. It, it's not just a simple, I can't do it in my home kitchen at that point. Um, you know, they've got some good manufacturing practices that are um, required for that. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I just kind of want to give you some examples so you can think, ah, that counts me out pretty quick or, hey, I think that may be something feasible for me. Um, 
you know, the, the room that you're going to be processing, I would assume most of you are going to be processing this on site or at your home. Um, you know, you're going to have to have basically a separate room um, or um, a separate facility within the house. Um, it has to have an exterior entrance, floors, walls, ceiling, smooth, non-absorbent. I mean, at, at this point, you're really starting to look um, more like a food manufacturing, more of a retail type establishment. You're going to have to have hand washing facilities, uh, two or three apartment compartment sinks, um, adequate water disposal. They're going to start testing your waters, checking where your water's coming from. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of things to consider if that's the avenue you want to go down. Now, that doesn't mean you can't. There's obviously a lot of people that are out there doing that, um, but it may take a little bit more to go this direction. Um, at this point, your labeling kind of takes a different turn as well. Um, and there are some guidelines set forth in the um, Texas Agriculture Code, also through the FDA's um, labeling guidance document and you're welcome to, to print that as well go on the internet and um, you know kind of look at all that it's just to generically think about that it it's your typical common name ingredient list um, especially you're going to have to go this route if you want to start doing those combined type products those infused type products um, or if you're wanting to make um, what they call structure or function claims. Um, I heard Jessica say, you know, helps with, I can't remember what you said, something about allergies. You know, once you start trying to make claims on these products, that's when you're going to have to start getting more permits. You're going to have more regulations, um, more things to be involved on that. You may have to go through um, the FDA um, on that register your register your operation because at that point some of those become almost a cosmetic type um, product and that's regulated through the uh, oh, uh, medical and drug drug and medical devices sector of Texas Department of State and Health Services um, so that might be another avenue you need to explore if that's something um, that you think you're wanting to produce and or you're already producing so once again, once you start making those claims, it's it, you really start having to pay attention um, as to guidelines, um, permits, licenses, labeling requirements, things of that nature. And I did want to highlight in here that they they do have a recommended statement that you put on these. It's not a required statement when you start going this direction, but they recommend that you put on the label, and I'm sure many of y'all have heard that, um, not to to serve honey to infants under the year of under one age, one year, excuse me, one year of age, and that's due to the risk of in, infant botulism. Um, honey is a known source for botulism spores, so obviously we don't want the children to ingest that. Um, but once again, that's a voluntary statement at that point, but it is you know recommended. Um, Some other things to consider, um, I'll, just checking local jurisdiction. So wh wherever you're at um, in the state, if you have a local jurisdiction, a local health department, double checking with their rules and regulations as it, as it relates to, to having bees in the production of um, honey, honeycomb byproducts, things of that nature, because there may be something associated with, with that jurisdiction and something else to consider is your homeowners association if in fact you are in that type of situation or city ordinances things of that nature or county ordinances to make sure that um, you're able to do that i don't think a lot of people think about that um, but there are homeowners associations um, things of that nature that do not allow for for that type of operation to be you know, to be in that community. So just something to, to kind of think about and highlight, um, you know, w when you're, sounds like most of y'all probably already started this process, 
Um, so hopefully you've already done that. But if you haven't and you're exploring this as an option, double check and just, you know, I just want to make sure that that you are abiding by uh, local rules and regulations that relates to to what you're doing. I'm going to wrap this up and open it up for for questions. As I mentioned, um, definitely a feasible thing. Um, a lot of folks are doing it. A lot of people are having success with that. Um, so I really want to encourage you to continue on that path and um, just be abreast of the rules and understand that there are exemptions in place, especially for those smaller production operations, which hopefully um, some of y'all can benefit from. Um, once again, you won't have to get all the licensing and abide by so much of that, but at the same time, it does limit your options for who you sell to and where you can sell. Um, so just keeping that in mind and making sure you understand that because um, it is something, especially at those those farmers markets, things like that. The inspectors are there. There is local regulatory authority and state authority um, visiting those. And so you want to make sure that, you know, you're abiding by everything and you've got what permits you need um, to be able to sell to sell those products appropriately. And then uh, once again, just just like I said, double checking. There's a lot of gray area um, when it comes to things like this, um, but having that open communication um, with the, the local authority or Texas Department of State and Health Services um, can really can really be of benefit to you. Is there any questions? Jessica, do you have access to that publication link by chance on the AgriLife bookstore, the Selling Honey in Texas? That may be a resource that they might want to access. I do have access to that. So whenever I send out the recording for this session, I will include that publication so you all have it available. There's a couple links in there that have that have changed and I'm in the process of updating that publication. But any of that, it, it should say the title within the publication. And I checked them all today and they were the, the first Google search that popped up when I typed in the key keywords of that of that title, like Texas Administrative Code Beekeeping. You know, it was the first thing that the first chapter that popped up 131. Um, so hopefully you can find find that real easy if the off chance that link is broken in that publication. And if you ever have any questions, don't forget that you can contact your county extension agent um, in your county because that's what we are here for. So um, if nobody has any questions, we kept tonight pretty short and sweet, but next week will be more lengthy as we dive into hive management. Um, so if that's all we have for tonight, then have a good rest of your evening and we'll see you back here next week.